who's the uh, senior business manager with the Napier port. And you're well aware that um, uh, a lot of your logs uh, or other products going offshore will go through the port. And so what happens in the port and their cost structures and their efficiencies are pretty important to us all. And so Andrew, who's um, had uh, 23 uh, years of experience, uh, five years working for a, as a shipping agency and 18 years working in the marketing and commercial department of the Port of Napier, and he is responsible for all of operations in the port. So um, uh, Andrew will be talking about aligning port infrastructure to forestry. Andrew. Can everyone hear me in the back there? Fantastic. I understand there's 275 people here. I understand there is uh, about 260 people from out of town. Is that, is that about right? Yeah. Sounds about right? Yeah. Well, I thought I'd start by saying welcome to the Hawks Bay. <laughs> a couple of funny stories about that, actually. Uh, we had the Shield a year ago, as you may remember. We had it for a very, very short period of time. And I was invited to a function. And um, I arrogantly said at the time, no, no, I won't come to the function, I was travelling the next day. I said, I won't go to the function, I'll see the shield next week. And, uh, yeah, I didn't see it next week, it's taken a year to get it back. So, um, I really just thought I'd start by saying, welcome to the Hawks Bay, holders of the Ranfilly Shield. Hopefully, um, I've got to give another speech in, um, in 10 days' time, I hope to use the same slide and get the same laugh. So. <laughs> so, first and foremost, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, forestry is a hugely important part of what the sports business is. Uh, and so any opportunity to speak to an industry like industry group like this will take. Um, I tend to speak very quickly, I get very excited, I'm very highly strung, so if I'm speaking too quickly, Doug Ducker, I yell out, Lockie, slow down. Daisy, I'd expect the same thing from you for my stuff. <laughs> Welcome to Hawke's Bay, holders of the Ranfilly Shield, famous for probably four main things. First is we have 68 wineries here in the Hawke's Bay. So you're all forestry investors, I imagine you'll enjoy a wine or two. Um, so get out there and enjoy those. Uh, we have the largest um, gannet colony in, the, in New Zealand, actually in the world, on site. So you can actually go on a four-wheel motorbike or a, a uni mold or all sorts of things to get out there. Uh, what's the next thing that we're famous for? We're famous for Art Deco. So, um, uh, and why are we famous for Art Deco is because 1931, 3rd of February, at 9.56 in the morning, we had a 7.6 uh, earthquake on the Richter scale. Destroyed the, uh, destroyed the city. Uh, 256 people lost their lives. And uh, what wasn't destroyed in the earthquake, they um, rebuilt, uh, well, it was destroyed in, in a fire afterwards. And so 1931, 32 and 33, they rebuilt the city in an Art Deco style of Hawke's Bay. And Hastings, they, um, they rebuilt the city in a Spanish mission style. You'll see the greatest level of Art Deco concentration anywhere in the world here in Hawke's Bay, in Napier, in the, about the seven streets that are out in the main, in the main city. So why do I mention that is because the, the port has a very, very strong association with the city uh, around the earthquake. Uh, there was a vessel called the HMS Veronica sitting in the, in the port at the time of the earthquake, uh, and this, it's an Australian a Navy vessel. And the Australian Navy came ashore, rescued a whole lot of people and gave medical aid, and, then the, and the city and the port had a very, very strong association with the earthquake and with, with Art Deco. If you go down here to Marine Parade, there's the uh, Veronica Arch, uh, and the HMS Veronica Bell is actually rung 256 times at the, um, more, more, at the um, earthquake commemoration. So um, the HMS Ronald the Bell actually sits at the port. So very strong, very strong association. Right, that's uh, that's the Hawke's Bay. I'm a Hawke's Bay boy, born and bred. I can't let people come to the Hawke's Bay and not talk, tell them about it. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what, what are ports and what are ports do. We're a bit of a mystery to some people. Uh, what drives ports? What's it, what, what are the key um, key things that make ports work? What's Napier doing? What's Napier doing about the wall of wood and the wood that's coming? What are the investments they're making? How do they look after their customers? I've uh, been asked also to talk about the Port of Gisborne, so I've talked to Andrew Gaddam, um, the General Manager of uh, the Port of Gisborne, Eastern Port, and he's given me some information. And then we'll have a little Q&A. Bold statement. Seven words. Simple people here in the say, What are ports? Ports are infrastructure providers to facilitate trade. That's what we are. If you think about ports, they're long-term infrastructure businesses. We're not here. Um, the port started in 1886. So the, some people in the room are coming for a port tour later. I'll just use my big line. Uh, the original breakwater was started in 1886. They started directly out from the bluff. There was no, nothing there. They just started straight from the bluff and just drove themselves out. So ports are infrastructure providers to facilitate the movement of goods or trade. 
You can be, you can have lots of other economic um, uh, definitions, and I'm sure a man from the BNZ would probably have a long-winded thing, but we're simple port, we're simple port people, and we're the fundamentally port infrastructure providers to facilitate trade. Ports are economically driven. So are businesses, no different from anything else. Uh, in, the, in the Napier example, um, we're owned by a company called HBRIC, Hawke's Bay Regional Investment Company, and it's 100% shareholder of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Quite a lot of debate about ownership um, often, um, and I always say to myself, uh, if the port was owned by, say, the likes of Infotel, uh, or one of the big asset owners, would we, would we drive, uh, would we be more efficient, or would we be more aggressive, or would we be more customer focused? I don't know if we would. I think, in my personal view, having that um, regional council ownership gives a regional view. Now, it's a regional asset, the port's associated with 22,000 full and part-time jobs uh, here in the Hawke's Bay, about 140,000 people in uh, population Hawke's Bay. So we're, we're a big part of what, what the Bay is all about. Ports are only part of the supply chain. No matter how, how arrogant some ports would like to be, they are not the be-all and end-all of the supply chain. We are one small part of the supply chain. Transport infrastructure and the economics around transport infrastructure are the reason why ports exist. So many, many years ago, uh, and you always, you always read this, are too many ports in New Zealand. There used to be 145 ports in New Zealand all throughout. And of course we're now down to about 14 major ports. So why was there 140 ports back in the day? Well, it was because you couldn't move cargo long distances. So you can move cargo a little bit more distance and longer distance and a bit more economically. But the reality is, uh, the driver of ports is, is, is transport infrastructure. So that road, that rail, and one of the interesting things, I put people up there, is because if you think about the road transport industry, the road transport industry in this country is in trouble. We as a, we as a culture, we as a society have to accept that no one leaves high school and says, gosh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna be a truck driver. The average truck driver age here in New Zealand is now about 58. And I think that's gotta be a concern to us all as, 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 a, um, as a society. How are we going to move this cargo to and from? Now, um, those going up to Pampak, and I hope I don't steal any of your thunder, Doug. One of the things um, uh, Pampak's done is got on board, of course, with the HPMV, the heavy vehicles, uh, heavy weighted vehicles. So where we used to have four trucks coming from Pampak to uh, port every day bringing pulp, we now have two trucks coming bringing pulp where we used to have four. So that's the kind of innovation I think that New Zealand has to start to gra uh, gravitate to. Of course, heavier trucks and longer trucks, everyone gets upset. Can't have that. Go to Australia and see a road train. You know, and most of these things are mine for people aren't. So I just, we have to start to think about innovative ways that we actually come up with solutions for these problems that we're going to have. Now, no disrespect, and I've got a little bit of grey hair in myself, but you know, this is an ageing an aging group. We have to be thinking about, we have to be thinking about where our country is going to go in the future. As I said, fixed infrastructure. We have two customers. We have shipping lines, people who come and pick up the cargo, and we have customers, importers, and exporters who use the ship. Shipping lines have these wonderful things called ships that float. And so if they decide that their assets no longer um, uh, are needed in New Zealand, they float their asset away. Ports have a fixed infrastructure. We can't move our asset. Our asset is what it is. So our shipping line customers are quite fickle, and so they can decide that they can move their assets wherever they want to go. Limited ability to grow on port. Has anyone here for the media, by the way? No, oh, good. Right, I'll say this. <laughs> I don't want myself to trouble actually last time I said this, but I'll say it again. Limited ability to grow, land side. The concept of reclamation in this country is outrageous. It's the most outrageous thing I've said. Reclamation. In Singapore, they're doing a 250 hectare reclamation at the moment for their port. As soon as they finish that reclamation, they're moving on to their 300 hectare reclamation. 300 hectare reclamation. The idea here in New Zealand that you could reclaim a hectare of land from the sea is outrageous. Literally, we believe as New Zealanders, I don't know if people in the room do, but in general, New Zealanders believe that that's going to kill every whale, dolphin, seal, living creature in the sea. That's what we believe. And so the idea of expanding our business or expanding our infrastructure in this country is a very, very difficult thing for us to get our head around. It's not anywhere else in the world. I mean, I saw the last bit of the man's um, speech from the BNZ. And, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure spend in China is mind-boggling. The infrastructure spend in many places actually is mind-boggling. But in New Zealand here, we struggle with it. Where are we going? Cargo equals ships and ships equal cargo. Two schools of thought. 
many courts believe uh, one or the other. We're very, very, very strong believers in cargo equals ships. Ships will come and go. Shipping lines merge. Shipping lines, international shipping lines, container shipping lines, uh, are global corporate. Uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> the largest shipping line in the world is called Maersk. Uh, it's owned by a company called the AP Moller Group. The AP Moller Group is one of the top ten companies in the world. Maersk is the largest shipping line by a long way. It's one of the smallest divisions in the AP Moller Group. So it's a very much a, a global corporate and driven, and it's driven by its economics. They don't come to New Zealand because we're nice people and we've got great cargo, blah, blah, blah. They come because there's a profit to be made. It's not, it's not all gentle and fluffy. There's not a lot of hugs but going out at nurse, I tell you. It's a very much economically driven business. Understanding for courts, understanding the cargo mix is hugely important. What shape of the cargo is going to come? So forestry is a really good example. Is it going to come as a tree? Is it, is it going to come as a log? So is, is it not going to come as a tree, obviously. Is it going to come as a log? Is, it going to come, is that log going to be chipped? Is that log going to be sawn and put into sawn timber? Is that sawn timber going to be green or kiln dried? If it's kiln dried, it's going in a container. I'm talking fast. Keep up. <laughs> is it going to be pulp? Is that pulp going to be in a very great bog vessel or is it going to be in a container? Those questions have a huge impact on what shape the infrastructure is at the port. Now, just put these two, next two slides up, only just for interest's sake, just to kind of give us a little bit of a reality check. We compete in New Zealand, and I'm sure we all know, we compete in a global environment. In the shipping environment, um, I'm on a plane tomorrow, uh, going to Singapore, we have four meetings in Singapore. We'll be sitting in one of the offices um, of one of the shipping lines, overlooking the port of Singapore. There'll be, there'll be one and a half million boxes, one and a half million containers sitting on site in Singapore tomorrow, just understanding where New Zealand fits. Container lines, container lines. The fleet currently, as at the, uh, one of the great things about our business is we measure, measure, measure. Um, one of the, uh, the 17 point, almost 18 million TU, 20 foot equivalent units. So floating around the sea when you see those container ships, basically there's 18 million TU capacity. That's growing 5.3%. Uh, our industry. We're growing each year 6.4%, and the year after that, 7.3%. Global growth, of course, is about 25 so anyone knows anything about fifth form economics would know the supply and demand curve is completely out of whack. But anyhow, so New Zealand is 0.2% of world trade in containers. Right? New Zealand will be 2.5 million containers this year. 2.5 million containers this year. 1.3 million of them are full. So just understanding that a large portion of them come into this country empty. So global scale. I know this doesn't got anything to do with coordinators, but it just gives a, it gives a broader view. Global scale. Top 10 ports in the world, over 205 million TEU. Now remember, remember, New Zealand is about 2.5. So if we put New Zealand on the list, I think we're 49th. So it just gives an idea and understanding of where we sit globally. And so when Napier Port, even the Port of Tauranga, who everyone gets very excited about, uh, at 800,000 TEU, probably not that important globally. New Zealand's not that important globally. So they, it just gives a flavour for why lines come here. They come here because they're economically driven. Thank you, Port. There's my passion right there. 4.2 million tonnes. Uh, one third of the business is containerised. Uh, one third of the business is containerised. Two thirds of our business is bulk or break bulk. One third of our business is import. And two thirds of our business is export. So very much driven in export economy. Um, the core part of our business is food and fibre. Food and fibre. In the, um, in the 2008 global financial crisis, or the GFC, where's the bank man? GFC, I said, the GFC. Um, our, our container business didn't change one iota because it's driven by food and fibre, things, things that the world needs. We can all not have a new television set, we can all, um, we can all not have a new car, but we all of us need something to eat. So it's um, a pretty important part of our business and, and actually a very strategically important part of our business. So I'll, I'll rip in. <coughs> Forestry, hugely important, massively important to our business. 53% of our 53% of, of our business is forestry. If you take the export component of it, 65% of our business, 65% of our business is based on forestry. Now, make no bones about it, for Napier Port, we have this magnificent thing called Pampac. Pampac is 23 kilometers from the port. Pampac contribute about 850,000 tonnes of cargo to our port. There's no getting away from that. 
that's what that, that's what that is. The mix of Pampax business has a huge impact on what infrastructure we build. And so we have a strong relationship with Pampax. I know there's a lot of people coming from Pampax either tonight or we're here now. Um, what Pampax does, what the decisions Pampax makes are fundamental to the port and how we develop infrastructure. So mix, hugely important. How am I going for time? Russ, am I all right? Right, I don't even start it. I don't even start it all <laughs> right, you might, uh, you might think a madman put this uh, this, uh, this track together, but uh, he didn't. Uh, I was just trying to remind myself of things I wanted to talk about. So I'm not colour blind. So 2000, this is log volume because this, this room's excited about logs. Um, log volume, uh, so since I've been in the port 18 years, in uh, 1996, I don't know if you all remember the thing called the Asian crisis, uh, we just spent $17.5 million building the log berth, and we did 60,000 tonnes of logs that year. Uh, so that wasn't too good. Uh, but because we're a, a long-term infrastructure business, um, uh, that, that investment paid off. So uh, 2012, we did uh, just under uh, 900, 900 and uh, 920,000 jazz, about 950 tonnes. Uh, last year, we, we cracked a million, which is pretty exciting. Uh, 1.1 million. And this year, we'll do 1.3. Now, next year, will be about the same. Um, we see some forests cut out. Rainier cut out the uh, Matariki forests. Um, Pierre Paulson will finish the Talbot District Council Forest, um, but we get uh, new volumes coming through, Earnsaw volume coming through, and we're picking up a lot of volume out of, um, out of the Wanganui region. In 2016, we see the Earnsaw Taitoki volume come, start to come through, start to be um, harvest. So I'm a port man. I, the business for me is to understand where this volume is coming from. I need to know where's this volume. Is this volume real? Because we're making infrastructure decisions now for 10 years' time. So we, we, we forecast on a 10-year cycle. Um, uh, KPMG think we should do it on a 50-year cycle. But unfortunately, to be honest, sometimes, quite long you started. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people, um, sometimes people don't, um, you yeah, rock me there, rust crock, you're only about a quarter of the way through. Sometimes, um, uh, sometimes people don't, um, uh, well, move on, move on, that's right. <laughs> 2019, Roger Dickey Forest is starting to hit, so um, Steve Bell's giving us information, so we're very excited about that. And, uh, and of course, your volume's coming through, which is, um, which is huge. We think at that point the, uh, the port will crack over 2 million tonnes of logs. Now, just understanding the port of Gisborne, at the moment, they do about 2.2 million tonnes of logs. Uh, we'll be there in about 2019. So we're putting a whole lot of infrastructure in place to ensure that that takes place. Increased use of rail. So what we're doing is a, uh, what we're doing is a port as we're seeing um, cargo volumes come from further distances away. So we have that wonderful thing called a fixed asset. So the more volume through our fixed asset, the better. Oh, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Napier Port, we put, um, what we did is, uh, we were trying to get rail to, um, to actually do more volume. And they said, look, we don't have enough wagons. Uh, we don't have enough, uh, they're called USL wagons. And we said, look, what kind of wagons do you have? And they said, we have these UK wagons. We said, okay, you've got some UK wagons, why don't we buy some log bolsters? and we'll put our log bolsters on top of the UK wagon. We spent $260,000, built six sets of log bolsters, and we started a, a trade through from Wanganui. Rail went, gosh, that's a good idea, isn't it? That works quite well. We're going to get some bolsters made in China for about $70,000, uh, and, but now we've got a capacity that actually, we have somewhere between 30 and 35 wagons, um, uh, about every, every two days coming from, uh, from Wanganui. Land use, we're driven by land use. Remember I said that the idea of, um, of reclamation is madness in New Zealand. We can't have that, that's fine. So what we have got is air, and we can use more of that. So we're stacking uh, logs higher and higher. So we've got our, we've got our friends, we've, I'm full of hot air, I tell you. Um, we've, got, we've got our friends at the marshalling companies, uh, and what we've said to them is we want you, if we provide the infrastructure, we want you to stack the logs higher. So we started off a five metre booking, about four and a half thousand dollars each, and the marshalling company said, hey, no, no, we can go higher than that, it's great. Let's go to a six metre high booking, these are about five and a half thousand dollars. We've spent a million dollars on bookings. I can't reclaim any land, but I can go higher. So over, over our total capacity, we've probably, we've probably gone about 15% just with bookings. And of course, the bookings is a lifespan of, depends if the marketing company look after them. Um, uh, they, but um, generally, they look after them pretty well. They have about a five year lifespan, so 15% over five years are giving us an economic payback. I'm really talking fast now. <laughs> land use. We had some acid tanks on port. Um, when I first started the port, we used to do a lot of sulfuric acid, um, acid imports. I don't like you, eh? I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like you at all. <laughs> so we get, 
the acetane is reproducing in volume through the port, so we broke the lease with Ravenstone and said, look, we don't want the acetanes on the port anymore. Let's create the land, and that's actually up by the main log yard. And uh, so what we're going to do is um, reconfigure that. For us, it's about 0.8 of a hectare. It doesn't sound like a lot. If you can't, if you can't reclaim land, it's a big thing. Here we go, I'm about halfway through. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> So there are those acetates there, they're gone. All right. Uh, and this area here is the hard sand area. It's 1.6 hectares of hard sand, which allows us to fumigate logs. Understand um, logs that go to China have to be fumigated. So under deck, they can be phosphine. On deck, they're methyl bromide. Uh, methyl bromide ha happens on a hard sand area here, here, here. Now our customers said to us, you know that's good, but we haven't got enough space. We need more area. We need more area to do hard, uh, to do hard sanding to do, um, and to do um, uh, fumigation. So we said, okay, we'll listen to our customers, what they say. So the board approved in June of spending $7.5 million to seal the whole yard. So we're currently in the process, we're three quarters of the way through that process of sealing the entire yard. That'll give um, more space uh, for people to um, do more deck cargoes. A lot, of, a lot of Port New Zealand can't do the fumigation or can't do the um, fumigation of deck cargo, so they can load a ship under deck and then left. So uh, many of the exporters in New Zealand say, hey, what do I do? If you're a port that can do deck cargoes, you have more ships. More ships, greater throughput, greater turnover. Right, I'm going to run out of time. Probably. <laughs> That's just a photograph of, um, of actually the hard sand going on. There's 22 pieces of kit there. So um, we're, we're actually four weeks ahead of schedule and we're on budget, so that's fantastic. Not to talk about that. Understanding. For us, uh, for us, uh, I'm a commercial man, we have not a big department, there's two of us. We spend a lot of time trying to understand what our, um, what our customers want to do. What are the, what are the things that uh, the industry needs from us? What are the infrastructure that we need to build to ensure that we can service any industry that requires it? So, whether that's forestry, whether it's fertilizer, whether it's the container industry whether that's um, whether it's pulp storage, whether it's pipelines for oil, whatever that is. What is the future of the business? And what is the long-term future of the business? We spend a lot of time trying to understand that. We like to provide what's needed, but it's based on trust. And we have, uh, we have, quite, we have I think we have very strong relationships with people. We actually try and understand what they're going to do. And people that, people, uh, that we deal with understand our business as well. We spend a lot of, as you can tell, I'm quite passionate about the port. Really, I needed an hour, Russ. Um, but, um, <laughs> You know, we, we really, uh, and I think people understand the passion that we have. They understand that we, um, that, 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 that our business is important to, to us, and their business is important to us as well. But we can't, we can't provide service to their business unless, um, unless we've got the right infrastructure. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. <laughs> Let's have a vote. Can I have five more minutes? <laughs> Can I'm going to move on. One of, the things, uh, one of the things we have, because we're using different lands areas, because you can't always be in the main log yard, we're opening up other areas in the port to use as storage. Uh, a very large area called E area. Uh, one of the things that um, the marshalling companies and I'm sure David will talk about, is they've brought in this really, uh, this really great innovation that's here, is a 100 ton truck with 90 tons. So we can move 90 tons from one end of the port to the other, off highway, quite cheaply. And so what we're trying to do is um, we're detaching the berth and storage. So you might berth here, but your storage might be here. And so um, the, the likes of um, ISO and C3 are coming in with these really great handling techniques that we can move large volumes of cargo within the port at very low rates. Not that low though, hey Daisy. Economic. <laughs> we have a mixed model use, we have a mixed land use. So this is, uh, I'll just put this up here. This is um, 20th of March this year, um, four wolf is full of logs. Absolutely chocolate full of logs. This area up here is called Two North. That was full of containers and full of timber and all sorts of things. Um, within 14 days, because our container business actually changed, we actually got a whole lot of containers up here and we've moved a whole lot of logs in this area here. We've received them. So we don't see land as being one thing. Uh, the challenge for someone like me at the port is to actually ensure that we use land all the time in a different way. So it's all about using the, the land at the best possible. Um, who's got the most need and when is that need? And so that's what we do. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm in trouble. Eastland Port, we don't worry about Eastland Port, there's no time. Right. Eastland Port, Eastland Port look, uh, they do about 2.2 million tonnes in total, 98% of that is actually logs. Um, the interesting thing is, we'll do 1.3 million tonnes of logs, native port, 1.3 million tonnes of logs, we'll have 88 vessels. They did 2. about 2 million tonnes of logs and had 110 vessels. 
So what that means is every vessel in Gisborne is loading more. Now it's a different mix, there's, there's three customers as opposed to about six, but it's just um, one of the things about infrastructure spend, it does the port build another log berth, or do we make storage less, so it actually creates greater turnover. So it's a balancing act. Uh, their log yard would seal the cost of $16 million. Their, their log yard is a little bit um, worse from wear than ours, so ours costing, our, ours costing total about $10 million, so $16 million for them. Uh, they have an anti uh, debarking and anti-sap stain, there's a lot of prune log up there, so they're doing that. Uh, our prune log all goes to Doug, and he sorts it up, which is good. Um, they're looking to expand their upper log yard to um, adding another 1. 1. 1.5 hectares of infrastructure. They have this Matafero site, which is off-site, uh, which is two something hectares. They're going to get any consent to go to um, another five hectares, so seven hectares. So what I suppose all this means is ports are very much uh, involved in the forest industry. We're actually building an infrastructure to ensure that your volume is going to be able to handle efficiently and effectively through ports. So, right, I'm in lots of trouble. I'll put my head down here. Thank you very much. Thank you.